Hi there, you guys. We didn't get to have class, so we're going to try doing class this way. I've never done it before either, so we'll just give it our best shot and hope we don't get too much messed up. I wanted to talk to you today about a story I know you know all about, but it's a story that there's a lot of things you might not know about. And this story features something most of you guys like really well. It features rocks, different kinds of rocks. In fact, it features five rocks. I know Canaan and I know Jeremy. They collect rocks. They know about rocks. I think Lavender collects rocks. Well, the rocks actually play a really important part in the Bible. And five rocks are especially significant. Now, while you're off and you have to stay inside or hang around your house, this would be a good time to go out and look for rocks. I know some of you already do that, and you might look for some shiny rocks and bring them in when we meet again, and you can show us what you found. The other thing is there are lots of stories that are connected to rocks in the Bible. And so if some of you want to look some up, or if you think of some you remember that have to do with rocks, and you want to share them with me this week, you can. Uh, if you have, your parents have, or whatever, an email account, my email uh, address is 319cab at google.com. So I'd be glad to get an email from you telling me of the rock stories you thought of. Now, this story started a long time ago, and it's a familiar story to you. It's not one you probably that you haven't heard. A long time ago, there was a time in Israel when Samuel was uh, the judge who ran the country. And he was the last judge. And God called on him to raise up a king because that's what the people were demanding. And so he chose to get uh, Saul. Unfortunately, he was not a very good king. He did not have as much faith as he should have. He did things that were wrong and he didn't repent. And uh, so there came a time when God said to Samuel, he said, you need to go and anoint, and anoint means to pour oil on the head of the person who God is going to give a special assignment for. And so he anoints David, he prays over him, and then it seems to be kind of hidden at that point. And David goes right back to taking care of the sheep and doing his everyday jobs. And time passes. Well, after a little while, the Philistines, who were the enemies of Israel, came over and they were trying to drive the Israelites out, steal their stuff, and take control. And the key fighters among the Philistines were a family of giants. And of course, you know the main giant. What was his name? That's right. His name was Goliath. He was the main leader. But Goliath had four big brothers, and I mean big brothers. They were all giants too. So there were other people in the crowd that were big. But Goliath was probably about nine foot six inches tall is what most estimates are. Goliath was a warrior from the time he was a young kid. And he had always done that. That was his way of, I guess you'd say, making a living. Now, at that point, when the country became in jeopardy, David's three older brothers went and joined the army. David's three older brothers were at least 20 years old because you had to be usually 20 years old to be in the army. They may very well have been a little older than that, but they were at least 20. His other four brothers are not mentioned as being in the army, so presumably they either didn't go in or they were younger. So most people think at the time this story really happens that David is between the ages of about 15 and 19. Uh, I don't think many people realize that David takes on Goliath that young, but he actually does. So meanwhile, he is coming down. Uh, David is doing different chores. There's several other things some other day in class we'll talk about. But the main thing that happened was Jesse, his father, told him, take a break from the sheep and take supplies down to your brother. In those days, they had to supply a lot of the food that their own children ate when they were at war. And so he sent down there 10 loaves of bread. He sent some bags of grain and he sent 10 cheese, I think, down to the army. And he had David take that stuff down. 
Now, David was just like any of you boys would be. He was interested in finding out what's going on and how's the country doing, just like now while we're in this coronavirus thing. Everybody wants information. They want to know how we're doing, are we winning, what's happening. So when David got there, to his surprise, this big character comes out. Now, you have to realize this, and you know I'm not a good artist, so you'll have to fake it, and I hope it doesn't turn out being backwards on here. But this up here is supposed to be a mountain, and this is the Israel side. This blue is a brook. There was water down in the valley, and this other side represents a big hill where the Philistines were, and they're coming down this way. And actually, when we see David there, David is hearing about this, and he hears Goliath, who would walk down toward the bottom of the hill, and he would shout at the Israelites, and he would mock them. He would say, hey, you dogs, come down here and fight me. We could solve this easy. Nobody else will have to get killed. Send me one guy. I'll fight him. Whoever wins is the winner. And of course, when he did that, the Israelites would be up here. They don't want to fight somebody who's nine foot six. They're scared to death. And the person who should be fighting is King Saul because he's six six. He's bigger than anybody else. But he's not a warrior, and he never was. And God really probably didn't intend him to be a big warrior. But anyway, he was too scared. He didn't have that much faith in God. And so David heard this, and he's like 16, 17 years old probably, and it made him mad. He said, who does this guy think he is that he can challenge the armies of God? Nobody should be able to challenge the armies of God. And so he says this stuff out loud, and King Saul hears it, and he comes over and says, you're just a boy, you're a kid, which was a way of saying you're a teenager. You're not big enough to fight him, and you're not old enough to fight him, because he is going to make mincemeat out of you, because he's been a warrior all his life. And David said, in, in our words today, David said, oh, no, he's not. He is standing against God. God can defeat him. I'm not afraid of him. And then his older brother, Eliab, comes over and said, what are you doing down here? You're just a little kid. You just got nosy and came down, didn't you? Isn't that the way it is with older brothers sometimes? Don't they drive you crazy? Well, anyway, David paid no attention to him, and he said, no, that's not the point. These are uncircumcised Philistines who are standing against the army of God, and you need to stop them. Well, Saul got encouraged by that, so he says, well, if you insist on doing it, I'll help you out. I'll give you my armor. David tried on that whole suit of armor that belonged to Saul, and none of it worked. It just was too big. Imagine a teenager trying to wear a six foot six guy's helmet, his coat of mail, and drag his sword around. He just couldn't do it. And so he said, forget this, King Saul. I appreciate it, but I'm just going to let God do it the way God wants to do it. So David took his weapon that he was used to using, and believe it or not, his weapon was a slingshot. As you know, a common slingshot, and he had five smooth stones that he picked up when he went down the brook. David went marching down where these green tracks are. He got to the brook, and he stopped there and got his five stones. He didn't even have any ammunition when he was talking to King, uh, talking to Goliath. He just picked up the five stones. Goliath is over here on the hill, still shouting nasty remarks at him. And so finally, when Goliath gets up, evidently Goliath was sitting down. This is the first time I ever realized that when I was reading the scripture. It says Goliath rose. That means he was sitting either on the bank or on something over there. Now you have to realize Goliath's got a suit of armor on that the, the male part, the what they call the uh, armor male, is that heavy metal that's all over him. And they claim that that would have weighed about 150 pounds. It's like carrying a full-grown man on your chest. He had uh, uh, holding his um, spear, which weighed 30 pounds. He had on pad-like things like you wear for soccer, only his were made out of metal, and they weighed about 30 pounds each. So getting to his feet wasn't too easy. Then he also had a person who carried his shield. He didn't have any hands to carry his shield. He had one hand with a sword in it, and he had another hand with the spear in it, and he had a shield which was supposed to be held in front of him to protect anything uncovered, which wasn't much with all the metal he had on him, and he had a kid who carried that. 
the kid was probably scared to death because he didn't have anything except to hide behind the shield. So Goliath got to his feet and started down, and David started speaking back. He said, who do you think you are that you can defy the armies of the living God? God will take you out. And he said, I'm going to take your head off of you, and I'm going to uh, encourage our people so much that they'll come in and defeat your side, and the carcasses of your bodies will be fed to the birds. David wasn't exactly shy, was he? But he wasn't bragging on what he was going to do. He's bragging on what God was going to do because he knew that it all rested on him. So David stopped at the brook. He picked up five, I'm sure, nicer, smoother stones than this because when you have stones in the crib, the water makes them get nice and smooth. And he picked up five nice, smooth stones. Now, why do you think he took five if he was trusting God? Does that mean he didn't trust God? He thought he might have to fight another battle? Well, Goliath did have four big brothers, but he never had to use any of those stones because God took over, just like David was trusting him to do. David was doing what he knew how to do, and then he was going to leave it to God to do the rest. You have to have faith. That's what faith is. Faith is, I trust God to do what I can't do that he wants to get accomplished. And so as he went across there, across the brick, brook, Goliath stands up and starts coming down toward him. And David puts the first of the smooth stones in his slingshot, pulls it back. And I don't even think they were that close together. Now think about this big giant. You can't hit him anywhere in the chest area or the leg area. Plus there's a shield in front of him and he's got a big helmet on. The only place that's vulnerable is right here in his head. And so that's what David aimed at. He just pulled back. He'd aimed at lots of stuff and killed it. I'm sure he had hours of time while he was all by himself with those sheep that he did target practice with that slingshot. And he never needed it any more than that day. And he let it go. And then God took over and the rock went with so much force directly into the head of Goliath that he literally fell to the ground. And he was dead, the scripture said. But David took no chances. He did exactly what he said he was going to do. He ran up to the body of Goliath. He took Goliath's own sword. He didn't have a sword with him. He took Goliath's sword, which must, must have been fairly big, and he used it to hack his head off right there on the spot. And you know, I've often wondered what that kid did that was carrying the shield. I bet he was out of there faster than a rabbit because he did not want to deal with this. So he dropped that shield and he took off. And scripture says that David actually picked up the head. I always visualize him holding it by the hair and carried that head into Jerusalem. And it also said that, uh, that David gathered the armor together, put it in a pile. And we know for sure that he took the sword of Goliath and he took it over to one of the priest's places in the, uh, in the kingdom. And uh, the priest kept it underneath an ephod he had. Because one time when David needed that sword against King Saul, he went back and asked this priest if he had any weapons. And the priest said, the only thing I have is the sword that you took off of Goliath. And and David said, give me that. That's the best sword I've ever seen. So it was a good sword, but you have to be alive to use it. So God accomplished his purpose, but he's using a kid who's a teenager. It's amazing who God uses. He uses a heart that has faith and who trusts and who believes. And all David had to do was do the things he knew how to do with the stuff he knew how to use. And God did the rest. And I want to tell you, that's pretty much how it is in life. It doesn't hurt to learn new things that God can use. But, you know, remember, faith is about God doing it, not about you doing it. And, of course, in that case, you need to give God the credit because he's the one that did it. Now, these are trying times. And I'm sure a lot of you are not missing school but you are probably a little scared and you are a little worried and a lot of your parents are probably worried because there's a lot of things going on that you don't even understand that are trying. But God knows and he understands. You need to keep the faith. Do what you can do and trust him for the rest.